Yeah. Welcome back to the Vermont House Appropriations ah. Committee. It is Wednesday, January 25th, 2023. It is a couple minutes after 1.30, and we have with us the chair of House Human Services. We've asked for their participation because their part of the VAA is very extensive, and we're grateful for your help walking us through the letter. Do we have your letter? You have it. Do we have it, Erin? Yes. 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 Okay. I don't have it. I don't mean, I mean, your, your email has it. Okay. So let me bring that up. So commit, does the rest no. of the com committees have it? Not yet. No. Not yet. Not yet. All right, Erin. That's perfect. Post it and Sorry. bring it up so we're ready. <laughs> I do not have it posted. Thank you, Jeff. So <laughs> Always. Oh. Pretty good for a chuckle. This is our temporary location, and we arrived here an hour and a half before we went live. It was discovered that none of the outlets on the outside wall <coughs> were functioning. So, I'm pretty sure our crew will be ready, and I keep saying this, but we can produce the Colbert show in 20 minutes. Oh, here's Madam Chair, you're the definition of making it work. Well, <laughs> I've got an incredible team, and they're We'll have to hang with me right now. I think my phone will be faster. Did, did, did it come from you? It came from uh, my committee assistant, Lori Morse. No, Is it posted on your website? Maybe we could find it there. And we don't have a printer in this <clears throat> world. I can give you my version that says um, just approve everything. Oh, there you go. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Erin, um, you don't have it, right? I do not have it. Is it, is it posted on your committee webpage? It is posted on the House Human Services Committee oh, webpage. Okay. Yes. I'm going to email find this there to as well. Today's date. Oh, so it's on your committee webpage. Uh, it is. It is also sent to your committee chair, but it might be easier and faster to find it on our committee's webpage. Yeah, while well, I send this to State Diaper Bank proposal. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know that one. Yeah. Here we go. So Aaron, I just sent it to you. Services? Okay. Yeah, Human okay. Services Committee. Yeah, well, under, oh, right. uh, it's under Katie McClinn. <clears throat> I got it. This one is to remind me when no, I'm it's under. Not paying attention. I so did shut. Is it today? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Under today. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. How long do we have you for that you are willing to go to? Uh, um, as long as you need me for, Madam Chair. Isn't that great? So, okay. we'll, try, we'll try our best because we know you're busy. That's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Our, our committee is functioning under the capable direction of my vice chair. This mentorship didn't last long, did it? <laughs> okay. Is he? He's throwing already, you under the bus. He is. He's not going to be able to find things anymore. He's already surpassed your. <laughs> the student has already surpassed the teacher. Oh, I've taken the pebble from his hand. Uh. Madam Chair, how would you like me to proceed? All right, we're going to wait for them to. Are you guys. Got it. You got it? Anybody? I don't want to get to. All right. For the record, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Uh, for the record, I am Representative Teresa Wood, Chair of the House Human Services Committee, and thank you for having me in your beautiful committee room this afternoon um, with a lovely view of downtown Montpelier. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here to uh, review the House Human Services budget adjustment recommendations for fiscal year 23. We have um, a number of adjustments, as you might expect. Um, the, the first thing that I want to do is, in, uh, if we, in general, agreed with 
the governor, you will find us not making necessarily very specific recommendations around that. However, of course, there's always exceptions and you will see the exceptions. Um, the language sections, I want to just particularly call out, I want to particularly call out the um, refugee resettlement investment um, for uh, the employment program. Uh, we learned that it's not necessarily like a brand new program. It's something that they are doing and is to expand that. Um, and that was contained in the language in, in particular. Um, well, I don't know if I'm not going to give you page numbers because what you have is probably a little bit different than what I have. Um, so I just wanted to uh, mention that as well as the CARES housing voucher program. Um, we uh, support that. Uh, we didn't specifically address that in our memo. We do address housing in our memo in other areas, but I just wanted to call those particularly, I think those were the only two things that I wanted to, to uh, call out um, in particular. So uh, let me move to the memo. We organize this by department. We comment on the Department for Children and Families, the Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living, and the Vermont Health Department. And for DCF, we break it down into uh, their major divisions and units of government uh, so that hopefully it's easy to follow. And we also indicate the, um, the B number on our memo so you can find it corresponding on your spreadsheet if you're looking. I do seek to be um, an overachiever. So um, uh, under the reach up program, um, this is something that is in the governor's recommend, but we really did feel we needed to make a comment here. Uh, frankly, in at the end of last fiscal year, or during budget testimony last fiscal year, we, uh, we encouraged the department because we knew that there was going to be an uptick in caseload. The department's own reports by their outside consultants indicated that, uh, and um, they did not feel that they wanted to uh, include that in their 23 budget request and said that they would be here in budget adjustment and lo and behold, they're here in budget adjustment with a major. Yes, I'm sorry, I see that question or a comment or something. Uh, yes, <laughs> Representative Harrison. Do you have any idea why there's an uptick in caseload? Um, you know, given that, you know, we, we still have extraordinarily low unemployment, um, and more jobs than people to fill up. Um, that is something that members of our committee are looking into in terms of looking at the FY24 budget, which we'll be able to report better for you on that. Um, at the the um, estimates that the department's consultant used take into consideration a variety of factors, uh, including the economy, including um, all, all the things really that you just spoke of, Representative Harrison. Um, I don't have a copy of their report right here. It is on the committee's, our committee's webpage from last year. I can certainly um, find, <clears throat> excuse me, find that and forward a link to you, for you to that report that shows what the estimates are based on. And what we're seeing is that those estimates held true um, in fiscal year 23 and that they are experiencing a caseload and therefore asking for this adjustment. So you're thinking they just under budgeted this year? They did under budget this year. We we pointed that out to them. Um, they they failed to follow their own recommendations from their consultant, and um, we pointed that out. And they said, "Well, we'll deal with it in budget adjustments," and that's why we're here. They did under budget. In in my opinion, Representative Harrison, it was under budgeted. Yes. Okay. No, thank you. I just, and I'm sure it's not a simple as looking at unemployment or workforce shortages. No. It just, it seems to me contrary, the trend seems contrary than what I would be expecting in a strong job economy. But and uh, often, oftentimes, um, the reach up caseload is a prelude to um, the future economic trends in the state. So, um, 
So I don't want to be a forbearer of uh, potentially bad news, okay. but I'm just letting you know is that the, that's... Is the bucket half full or This half is, uh, well, um, right now this is about 3,500 families, 3,480 families. Um, and I made a note to um, find the report that we received last year, and I'll send you a link to that, Representative Harrison. Thank you. Um, the General Assistance Emergency Housing, B321. Um, this... Uh, it's no uh, shortage of information and advocacy around homelessness here in the state, and um, we continue with that um, from our committee. Uh, we agree with uh, you know everyone who speaks to the um, who speaks to the uh, inability of the hotel and motel program to be a long-term solution to our homelessness problem. However, we do have a March 15th, 2023 termination date coming for the uh, existing transitional assistance housing program. And um, we are looking to uh, not have a, three particular categories of individuals be impacted by that change. And so we are recommending uh, a, what essentially right now would be in your terms, one-time dollars uh, to uh, extend assistance to those individuals, those households who have an individual who is 60 years of age or older, those households who have a person with a disability, and those households who have children 18 years of age and younger. Um, the number of in, uh, households that that means, uh, so families with children, there are 357 households. Um, those with uh, someone with an older Vermonter is 273 households, and those with a person who's living with a disability is 348 households. And you can see at the top of page two, we give you suggested language from legislative council um, that would uh, enable those individuals to remain housed until um, the end of this fiscal year. Uh, hoping that we are able to somehow during the 24 budget process work with uh, the department advocates, those individuals with experience, and uh, to try to come up with something that is uh, more sustainable. Um, I can tell you that this is not the full amount that uh, advocates um, were requesting. We prioritize those three populations uh, in our committee. Um, so we are recommending 13, almost $13.5 million, $13,424,710. Um, to ensure that those three populations that I spoke of uh, would be served through the general assistance housing program. So they would transition from uh, the program that's ending uh, in March to the general assistance program, which is an, an ongoing program. <clears throat> Representative Shai. Thank you, Chair. This is really helpful, and I really love having all those numbers as a numbers person. So we're talking, you're talking about 978 households that are impacted, and how does how do you arrive at the 13.4 million? Is there some formula? Is there like 5,000 a night, or a, uh, I don't know what what. How do you figure that out? We actually requested the data from the department. Okay. Um, so these are these are figures provided by the Department for Children and Families. Okay. And then the the two million. Um, I haven't gotten to that one yet, but. Oh, okay. That's fine. I'm about to. Okay. You mentioned it, but you're going to tell me. Yeah. Now. Okay. The the, the additional two million is um, right now. There are a number of uh, coordinated care teams. I think you. Heard of them? They're pulling together people from home health agencies, from various other agencies within the um, state government, as well as some of our community providers, and uh, they are attempting really to help with some of these complex cases that are out there who require additional care coordination uh, because uh, folks in the motel and hotel program are they don't generally receive care coordination. So this is people who need help with health care, people who need help accessing supportive services, and obviously uh, trying to find permanent housing as well. Um, and uh, a lot of this, uh, you'll note that we indicated that's for hiring and or retaining coordinated care teams. So uh, we are uh, providing some feedback that uh, most of this is being done right now by individuals who have 
some connection to um, either a current private provider and or uh, DCF itself. And uh, the additional resources are needed in order to be able to provide that complex <coughs> care coordination for those individuals who will hopefully, uh, if you recommend a, approval of this, um, be uh, maintaining in the hotel motel program through the end of the fiscal year. Representative Shai, did you have a question now? Yeah, that okay. Be, that be Thank you. Representative. <clears throat> so just quickly, uh, you indicate this wasn't the what the advocates were asking. What, would you mind saying what they were asking for? Um, for this aspect of it, the, the, um, the <clears throat> one that I, we have 13.4 million, yeah. they were asking for roughly 21 million. Okay, and additionally, you said you got this number doing some projections from DCF? Yes. Does DCF support this addition? Because I don't think it was in their no, oh, this is you. this is a committee recommendation. Yeah, no, I, I get that. Uh, uh, they uh, they support the governor's budget adjustment request. So they don't like the additional money then. Uh, I'm not going to put words in their mouth. Okay, they tell me they fine. support the governor's budget <laughs> okay. adjustment request. All right, thank you. Um, okay, so that's it for the economic services division. Uh, anybody? Uh, we all no, sound no. that. Okay, <laughs> moving on to Child Development Division, uh, B318, the Child Care Workforce. Uh, so you may recall, well, some of you may recall, a few of you may recall, <laughs> um, we allocated $7 million in last year's budget for retention, um, essentially retention bonuses to go out to the child care workforce. Uh, the Department for Children and Families has had a difficult time getting that money on the street. Um, there are roughly uh, $2 million of it has gone out and we're you know, now closing in on the seventh month of the fiscal year. Um, we investigated whether there would be the possibility of granting the remaining balance of those funds to a private entity, organization, in order to be able to maybe get those funds out to the child care workforce and providers in a uh, more expeditious fashion. Uh, we were told by the department that um, that really would not reduce the requirements for any of the grant agreements. Uh, and so uh, while we thought that that might be a potential solution, um, they tell us that because of their grant restrictions, that those all would need to be followed even by a third party. Um, we remain troubled by this, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, this is impacting the child care workforce and um, it is uh, what some, some providers refer to as a fairly onerous process to receive these funds. And um, I, I will point out that when the when the program initially launched this summer, um, the Department for Children and Families was requiring child care providers to expend the funds first um, and then get reimbursed for them. Yeah, um, of course there was a significant outcry about that. These are not programs that operate on a um, large margin. And so they had an inability to offer those and then be reimbursed for them. So um, they did uh, rethink that. Um, however, we are still faced with uh, significant delays in getting this money out the door. And I know that the department is working on this. They continue to work on it. Um, you know, we've asked if we can have assurances that all the money will be, uh, uh, you know, uh, make its way to the intended recipients. Um, we can't get any guarantees about that. I'm just putting that out there. So, um, we don't have any language or you don't have a... The only thing that we felt that we could really do in this regard is um, part of what the issues that some providers have told us is that they just literally don't have the um, capacity to sit down, look at the requirements, fill out the application, do the interface back and forth with the department, uh, get the grant agreement signed, and uh, you know move on from there. And so we are suggesting that with some of the money that's already been appropriated, that um, there's enabling language that allows the department to 
um, issue a contract to a uh, private partner that will assist child care providers in filling out the applications and getting them into DCF. DCF does not have the staff to be able to do that themselves. Sounds very familiar to the rural approach. <clears throat> Representative Shaw? Is there a reason it's so hard to get this money? I mean, you said the application process. Does it have to be that hard? Could they revise it and make it easier? Um, or are there some federal or other rules that make it? Um, I'm, not sure. mm, I'm trying to remember if this ended up being federal money or state money. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if... Uh, it is general fund. Do you have any input? for the child care retention? Yeah. It's general fund dollars. Yeah. So they can set their own, they can set the rules. Yeah. We have been unable to impact that, Madam Vice Chair. Okay, thank you for that information. So it's safe to say the rules have they're set it, already predicted that it's in the way. Not predicted. Has demonstrated that they're in the way of getting it. Yes. Yes, as well as well as the capacity of child care providers to a, a, apply for um, to apply for the funding. So um, the uh, the fact that a state general fund you know gives us more latitude and flexibility. Yeah. Um, that uh, I'm just going to say across AHS, we are hearing more and more about contracting issues. I'm just going to put that out there. Not only in DCF, but DCF has a lot of contracts and grants out. Um, so I, I'm not really sure what has happened in the grants and contracts administration world um, in the Agency of Human Services, but um, I have heard multiple complaints about that process and the difficulty of that process. And so I, this is emblematic of what I've heard from other providers not in the childcare world. Ma'am, can I ask a question on that? Uh, Representative Bloomley's first and then... then I'm you. okay. I, I got my answer. Thank you. Okay. okay. So when we talk about this area, this is in the Human Services Agency that's got the... that works with the grants and the assistance and the funds. And you're saying, if I'm getting this right, you're saying that they're having a hard time getting applicants to get the grants in or having a hard time processing the grants, or is it both? Um... I don't know how um, the workflow within the Agency of Human Services. I, you know, I, we didn't mm -hmm. speak to con contracts or grants managers. Yeah. Um, so I can't speak to whether or not they're feeling overburdened by the workload. Um, uh, I, I, I can't speak to that, um, Representative Dickinson. But um, I, I can speak to the fact that the community members, the child care providers, have found it difficult to apply for these funds uh, in, in many cases. And so that's why we're recommending using a, a small portion. We don't say a specific amount. If you wanted to put a specific amount, you could, but we're uh, suggesting that a, a portion of that $7 million be allocated to assist child care providers to actually apply for right. those funds. Right. But you see this in more than just child care. I am seeing this in multiple areas, okay. yes. You. The, the grants and contracts management. Um, I, I don't really know what's happened, but it's, it's like somebody flipped a switch and something had become extremely difficult. Yeah. When they weren't before. Uh, they've become more difficult. I mean, the state's contract and grant process has always been, um, you know, uh, a process. <laughs> you know, it's public funds we're dealing with. But, so I don't want to so, get too off track. I just, I just need to make that. We have a little bit of a line. Yeah. So Representative Shire and Representative Holcomb. So because it's general fund, they aren't restricted by, and they can, it sounds like, and I, and I believe it was our intent, having been on this committee last year when we created this, to make it as easy as we could to get the money out the door to the people who needed the money. And what I'm hearing is that the, that the agency has created something that has made it much harder than anyone anticipated to get the money, and that's a large reason that the money is out. And, I just find it a shame to think that we'd have to spend some of the money that we were going to give to the people who need it to hire a contractor to help them fill out the form so they can get the money. I mean, I, I, I appreciate that you're trying to help them out, but this just I don't seems disagree with you, Representative Absurd. Shire. Thank you. Good. I'm done. Representative Holcomb. 
did you have a chance to respond? I mean, you want, I look forward to the committee, but one of the things that they said is that due to liquidation timelines for the ARPA monies, they were unable to enforce the work requirement. So part of it, I think, is you're trying to also loosen the language. Uh, nope, that's not with regard to this. Okay. We will address that shortly. Okay. Okay. You good? I wasn't sure how long the line was. You said there was a line. I wasn't there was. Sure no, how long. Was it. Okay. Sure. Okay. Um, so um, that was the first. That was the first part of that. So uh, any assistance that the appropriations committee can provide to loosening up that uh, contracting requirement, we are all set to be on board with that. The next, uh, the next section uh, are funds that were as a result of the uh, H-171, which was a child care bill, uh, and set up student loan repayment assistance and scholarship programs. And um, you may recall that there, were, there was some specific language um, with regard to the qualifications, the timelines, and all of, all of that. So I'm happy to report that uh, one of the programs has been fully utilized and actually has a waiting list, and that's the TEACH program, um, yeah. which uh, I, I think that has something to do also with the fact that it was an existing program. So people knew about it, um, they were familiar with it, uh, and uh, that program was ready and you know they were on their way. So they already existed, it was, uh, it was um, well, has been well utilized. In terms of the a student loan repayment assistance, we are, rec so I want to say $2.7 million was allocated to that. Only $256,817.18. I just want you to know, we do get detailed. Uh, only $256,817 has been spent to date. Um, and uh, so we are suggesting, you will see on page three of our memo, we are suggesting some changes that broaden eligibility a bit to be able to utilize more funds and essentially allow the department more flexibility in, uh, in providing payments to the child care workforce. So um, the first you will see halfway down the page in uh, paragraph 2B, and that is uh, looking at the annual salary of not more than $60,000 from $50,000, uh, an increase of $10,000, um, looking to also impact um, child care directors. And then uh, in C, 2C, um, you will see that the language that says within the preceding five years has been struck. So um, Essentially what we're saying is if you are still paying off student loans and you're in the child care workforce, the fact that it's six or seven years old really is inconsequential. I mean, we really feel like you should be able to receive assistance. We want to keep you in the child care workforce. And so um, we are suggesting removing the preceding five years requirement. And these, by the way, for, for people who might be unfamiliar with this language, this is language that uh, the House Human Services Committee had put in the bill and was then adopted by the House and ultimately the Senate and the body. Um, and so we are recommending essentially changes to our own language. Question, Representative Page? Yes, I have a question regarding um, the federal scholarship program that we've heard so much about. Mm -hmm. Does that have any effect upon what you're trying to do here as well? Uh, yes, of course. I mean, that, that came about after our bill was passed, and certainly uh, people are eligible for, the people who are eligible and have applied for that um, might not think about applying for this, but um, in effect, they could be eligible for both. Um, and then we have added an additional category under C2, um, and this uh, connects, it, one, it adds master's degree, and it connects to the Early Childhood Career Ladder Certificate program through Northern Lights um, at the community college. And so, again, we are looking at um, the uh, additional education requirements and the professionalization of the field and uh, making uh, additional uh, education available to people in the field and 
broadening broadening what we are intending to spend this 2.7 million on so this is not requesting any additional funds unlike the housing um, this is just saying let's take what we've already appropriated and change the language a bit to enable mm -hmm. what we've appropriated to be used and that appropriation is all general fund before um Mm, that's something you have to speak with JFO about. I think there was some federal funds that got mixed up in that. That's the 2.7, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So are we on page four then? Uh, yes, we moved to page four. Oh yeah, there was one more, one more thing. Um, so what we were saying is if um, this uh, D is an addition, uh, that if you would have otherwise qualified um, when we make these changes, um, then you can receive, so if you applied and you didn't qualify because the program was more narrow now that we're recommending widening it up, you are eligible for a payment um, uh, if you had met the eligibility requirements within the last 12 months. So they can either reapply or just I, yeah. ho hopefully they won't have to reapply, hopefully they have the applications and they can just send them the money. But. Um, so it, that, this is just making it clear that um, we're essentially saying they're not retroactive to 12 months, you right. get you get to. They're not blocked out. They're not blocked out, right. Um, that's it, except for you will, you will be seeing a mention in the um, Family Services Division. Um, the Child Care Financial Assistance Program was underspent by five point something million dollars that is now being <laughs> transferred to the Family Services Division but I will address that momentarily. So um, we all set to move on from that. Okay, it looks like we are. All right, Children's Integrated Services. Um, last year, we, uh, this is one of the areas that has had a rate study over the past few years, and we have made incremental progress to moving the per member per month rate up. This is a, this is a, um, package of services for children with intensive needs, um, very young children with intensive needs. And this is, um, uh, they, we had received mixed reports, frankly, about whether or not the uh, department had instituted the 650 per member per month, which is what we had intended. Um, we verified that in fact they have. And however, there is also an increased caseload in this line. Now, the department is accommodating that increased caseload by transferring funds within the department, so there's no request for new funds. But this statement is just to merely ensure that they do not pay for the new individuals, who, the new caseload folks, at a reduced per member per month. We want to make sure that that 650 per member per month is paid for all recipients. I'll call on myself. <laughs> Madam Chair. Madam Chair. <laughs> We had a request, or at least heard a request in our public hearing around this. Does the number two, 265, does this ring a bell? 260, yeah. I don't know what you heard in your public hearing. Okay. Um, this, this is uh, a, a service that's required to be provided um, for eligible children. And um, it's essential, it, it's very early, uh, it's, part, it's part C. So if you, if, you, if you bear with me for a minute, we'll find it here. I just want to make sure that we're talking the same. Yes, I don't. If you, if you could elaborate on the question that you heard, I might be able to answer that. Uh, $265,000 for CIS, uh, higher for 1,575 families per month. Is that maybe the new case or? Um, we received assurances that um, that there is caseload growth, that they are accommodating the caseload growth by transferring from unused unused funds in other areas, and that we are wanting to make sure that the six hundred and fifty dollar per member per month that they did increase the rates for um, are applied to all individuals. <clears throat> so I think that there has been some concern on the part of community members that the new caseload people um, would get a lower rate. And um, there are sufficient funds within the DCF budget to accommodate this. Yes. So, so, um, okay. so it's not new. Well, what we heard from, who we heard from, just to give you a hint, was from the Winston 
Prouty. Prouty Center in Brattleboro. And we were going to ask them because we didn't know if they were asking just <clears throat> for their part of the world or is it a statewide? We haven't ferreted that out yet. Um, so you're you're saying that right now um, the 650, if it stays for everyone, is sufficient. 650, and they're covering all caseload. Okay. Go ahead. Then. Is is there any reason to think that uh, the department would in fact reduce the rate for new people? Um, Are they that's why you see doing this. Yeah, that's why we see a paragraph here because we had received feedback that um, there there was discussions about paying a lower per member per month rate for the new caseload. So you want language in here that says that won't happen? That, that, that is what we are hoping, yes. Okay. Do, do we have that or do you want us? Uh, we didn't that? come up with specific language, no. Okay, moving on to the Family Services Division. Okay, um, so essentially the savings that were um, achieved in the Child Development Division are being transferred to the Family Services Division. Family Services Division deals with foster care, deals with uh, juvenile and uh, justice involved juveniles, um, deals with a whole host of things in supporting um, children and youth um, who are either away from their family temporarily or in some times per permanently and those uh, youth who have uh, some court involvement. And so it's probably not news to anyone that um, since Woodside is closed, um, there has been a patchwork of, um, I'm trying to figure out how, how to appropriately refer to it. A, pa a patch, I'm just gonna say a patchwork <laughs> of things that have been cobbled together uh, under great stress for Family Services Division staff and Family Services workers in particular who have been uh, doing yeoman's work covering, covering some of these um, uh, young people who are struggling uh, significantly and, uh, you know, in some cases, causing physical harm to family services workers, and um, so I just need to put that out there. We have, we do, we by no stretch have a system that is accommodating <clears throat> this need right now. Um, it, you have all read in the uh, news about the Newberry facility, and that is in the Supreme Court right now. So we are not expecting any judgment on that for you know up to a year, and. Um, there, the department has submitted a plan, which you can find on our website, that essentially looks at a sort of a four-tiered approach to these uh, juveniles that need extra assistance. Um, what they are proposing to use these funds for are for a um, eight-bed uh, pod-like. We prefer to call them. Um, <laughs> What was that? Uh, homes, small homes. What do you call those? Tiny, tiny homes. homes. We prefer to call them tiny homes as opposed to pods, um, because they are going to be home for these youth um, for a period of time. And pods just sounds, I don't know, even like, smaller. It, yeah, I, yeah. Um, so we have had significant discussion with the department about this, um, and. Uh, It would be inappropriate to say that our committee, um, you know, supports um, supports this on, a, on any kind of long-term basis. Um, however, we really honestly feel like we're caught between a rock and a hard place at this point in time because we cannot, as a state, afford to do nothing. Um, it's impacting those youth, it's impacting the state's workforce, impacting the families, the school systems. Um, and so we cannot afford to do nothing. Um, is this the best solution? It is the best that people are able to come up with at the time, at this time. And it is a temporary, and I just want to call to folks' attention, temporary in this world means four, five, six years. We're not talking about temporary meaning four, five, six months. Um, so uh, we, uh, 
We are supporting the governor's uh, request in the BAA with conditions. Um, he's looking to uh, transfer 4.6 million for startup and construction costs of uh, a secure residential stabilization facility. And it's called something else in, on your budget sheet. It is B327, but uh, it's called, uh, I don't have it right here in front of me. It's called something slightly different. That's a different level of their, they, you know, they have a different, and this is what they testified that this would serve. So um, right now the plan is to utilize part of the 60 some odd acres uh, at the uh, St. Albans Correctional Facility um, to house the pods. Um, you know, we, we have some misgivings about that. Um, they want to use state owned land um, they have a community that is, uh, that they are, are working, that community is working with them, um, which is, um, again, one of the, one of the criteria, <laughs> uh, um, and it, it being temporary. Um, we have, uh, I've talked with Chair Emmons about this, because this is essentially a capital expenditure, and, um, she, uh, you know, you should obviously do your own checking on this, but we've had, uh, you know, a couple of discussions about that. She's aware of this request, and uh, she's also received a copy of, of our recommendations. We are saying that we need additional, inf so we're approving it with conditions. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. We believe that we need more information uh, around a longer term plan. There is no budget that's presented. I'm sure in 24 budget, we will see operating costs associated with this and further development costs. Um, but, you know, we were essentially just given a number, you know, uh, and without any backup information. And while we don't want to hold up the process from moving along because it does need to move along, um, you'll see in our narrative that um, we, we really feel that we need more information um, about what your plans are for location for a permanent facility um, and how long you think that that might take and the uh, timeline and budget as, as well as design um, for uh, this temporary facility. And we would like to see that by the end of March because uh, one, we don't, want to, we don't want this to be held up, but um, we also, uh, I, you know, I, we don't want to make, uh, a mistake, you know, um, and so we want to deal with the issue, but we feel like we need to do our due diligence in terms of seeing more detail than what has been provided to us. So we wanted to move the process along, but right. say we need more information. I've got Representative Shy, Representative Harrison, Representative Dickinson. Um, thank you for this. Uh, Two questions. If this were to get approved, how long would it take to be operational before it's actually operational? And how many people could it serve at one time? Um, they said that this is still requiring a year lead time and eight. Okay. Thank you. There's a, a quite a long lead time on eight. construction stuff that you know yeah that could be a lot worse so that's yeah well okay. that's our estimate <laughs> yes but we're not talking and i will much. say that the plan right now is to contract this service the actual service yes the staffing of it is oh, to contract. Staff and be private so okay. we would address that i'm presuming in the fy24 budget but they did tell us that this their intention is to do that <clears throat> Okay. Good. Representative Harrison and Representative Dickinson. Representative Page, did I miss you? No, or, no. Okay, good. Okay, I apologize if you already told us this, but um, I'm trying to get my arms around this. If we're doing eight tiny homes or pods, whatever you want to call them, and for 4.6 million, I want to get in the housing business pretty bad. I mean, we're the talking 800,000 a piece. Um, whatever 600 I mean well no remember there's site work that needs to be done there's I mean there there is no like um, you know slab of concrete out there that says okay come put your pot on me um, so um, and the, the thing that you will see in our description um, is that this also at the top of page five this is also for renovations required in the I'm not sure if you heard testimony about the Wyndham County Sheriff's program 
well, it's not the sheriff's program, Wyndham County um, mm -hmm. program that the sheriff's office is assisting DCF with. Two um, beds. That's two beds down there. Okay. Um, there's three beds down there, but there's one in the upper floor and two in the lower floor. Uh, the lower floor is not yet complete. It requires renovations in order to be occupiable, I guess if that's a word. Um, and so it would include um, what the work that needs to be done there. Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not, we need to do something because yeah. we keep kicking this can because we can't. Yeah, I understand. But uh, I know just the back of the envelope math seems like God, it's awful well, expensive. I mean, as as you can see, this is why we are asking for yeah, additional no, information. But, yeah. um, we feel like the process needs to move along, but we feel like um, <clears throat> that uh, we want more detail, frankly, about yeah. you know what the costs are for. You know how much is for site preparation, how much is for the actual pods themselves, how much is going to the design. There's some engineering work that needs to be done at the Wyndham County Sheriff's location right. you know how much money is allocated to that you know we, we uh, <clears throat> uh, so okay thank you well we will uh, hopefully have more information if you agree with putting such a deadline in here thank you um, <clears throat> more than a passing interest to me I'm oh really because <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you were aware now I spoke to the select board I guess that was presented to them last week or maybe a week before and uh, they have not approved it. They have sent it off to zoning and are thinking about it. Um, so I'm not sure where that's gonna end up, but the point is is that this is a correctional center. And I, I'm sure you understand that Woodside uh, was at once intentionally, and may still be, a therapeutic medical facility that would do with counseling and helping these young people who are troubled too. It was never intended to be a correctional center for youth. In fact, one of the reasons the federal government finally took away the money for Woodside is because mm -hmm. it sure did look like a prison. They treated it like a prison. They destroyed it. It was a mess, a uh, hot yeah, mess, yeah. and closed it down. So here you're placing this facility on a correctional center where they have it's, it's I, basically our maximum security facility. So, um, Representative, these are all the same conversations that we have had in our committee over the last two days. And it is, it is one of the things that um, Representative Harrison might find some humor in this that makes this uh, less costly than it would be is that they want to utilize state-owned property. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, are there other locations for state-owned property? They, they have not made an absolute final decision about that. They, as you said, are in discussions with the town officials about it. Um, the uh, other state-owned properties that they have considered um, have not risen to the top of their recommendations. It is, you know, we were very clear that, you know, what, what the services are for these youth are to try to enable them to, okay, take a moment, take a breather, realize you don't have to have a life like you have right now, uh, you know, and to um, get the support that they need in order to be able to change things for themselves and for their future. Um, and I think that I might even use the statement um, that we don't want them looking out their window and seeing barbed wire. Um, and it's, it's a concern for us. Um, and it is why on uh, paper, uh, you know, we're going on record as saying that we will not agree to a permanent facility being located on the same grounds as a correctional facility. Um, I, I did receive information that that is, um, that some people agree with that in the administration and others do not. You might recall the people who have been here for a while, about five years ago, the administration presented a plan um, to have a campus Mm -hmm. um, at the site of the St. Albans, um, which I understand is really in Swanton, is that correct? No, it's really in the town, but the address is Swanton. Oh, okay. Somebody told me it was really in Swanton. <laughs> so I was like, well, I want to give a town its due, but okay. So um, there, there was a proposal by the administration to uh, put the women's facility there, to expand whatever and replace or rehabilitate men's facilities, and to put the replacement for Woodside on that and as a body we said no to that um 
And, uh, you know, I have expressed, we have expressed our concern that this is, um, we don't want this to be viewed as our tacit yeah. approval of an incremental approach to mm -hmm. that ultimate plan. Yes. That's correct. Yes. We've yes. been very clear about that in human services. Um, we don't see another alternative right at this point in time. We are um, a member of my committee and a member of Representative Emmons' committee are going to do a site visit um, to visually see where this location is, the proximity <laughs> to the um, current buildings that are there, uh, and to have the opportunity to have more dialogue and details about exactly what the plan is. Uh, but I was pretty sure that um, your committee did not want us to wait on getting you our recommendations <laughs> for BAA to get all of that Find done. Out on the road. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, we wholeheartedly concur, Representative Dickinson, with what you just said. This is not a place for any kind of permanent facility. And frankly, it will have an impact on those who travel through there in the next period of time if we end up, you know, in the end agreeing, agreeing to that plan. We, um, we, we have concerns about it as well. Yeah, well, one, well, one comment and then um, another question. Um, temporary can sometimes mean a whole lot more than four to six years. I think we've been in Middlesex. 10? 10, 12 years, 10, 11 years. And I just wanna say that um, I would like more information on what the plan is. You know, is there going to be outdoor access for these these young people and how is that going to work with the correctional I mean that could be you know not that they would escape so much as that they would be then very close and be able to be very close to the, uh, the actual correctional center in a way that maybe neither you nor anybody else wants right and that's that's why I said we want to do an actual site visit um, have eyes on to it um, and carefully <laughs> deliberate about this um, and uh, we want to learn from you know, previous actions of the body. Thank you. I, I completely concur with and I'm sympathetic with your desire for more information about this interim solution and a more long term solution. I just, I guess I have a technical issue. We're talking about possible language in the bill, right? Okay, yes. so if the bill, if the language asks for a report by March 31st, but the bill doesn't become effective until April, April or whenever. Well, we had April, but then we said, oh, no, we really want it so, sooner. I know. I'm just wondering how mechanically, I'm very sympathetic with this. How do we do this mechanically so it has some pull. I mean, if this could wait until the budget, then they could put in the bill that it it's wait. That, will be, that wait. will be July. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it can't wait. So if we condition the BAA, how does it work? So much like we're thinking about other places where a great idea, go forth and develop, we call putting a fence around that money. Yeah. We're not appropriating it just yet, but we're saying we're reserving it for this process. So it's conditional. Conditional. <laughs> so in other words, they can't get the money until they supply, they comply with it. We're not right. We're not authorizing the use. That's that the intent of this is that we're not I'm authorizing there. the use of that money until they comply with a plan. Thank you. Kind of what we did with the night is it PSAPs and the dispatch regional dispatching. Mm -hmm. Great idea, not ready yet. And if they know yeah. this is in the budget with that date, they can start working so, on this now. They are already they are listening to us, and they know this is a priority, they, so they can work. Yes, on they they um, they reported to the Joint Justice Oversight Committee um, in December with um, you know sort of a, a sketch yeah. of the of the plan, and um, so they are working with the Department of Buildings and General Services, uh, and they have uh, got estimates for the pods and uh, and the like and I think it is uh, you know working with the appropriate officials in a receiving town they're trying to work in a collaborative fashion and um, you know I, I really feel our role is to try to make sure uh, that we mean temporary you know um, and that this is a transition to something that is more permanent and that um, you know, I guess a future legislature could change our decision, but 
Um, we're not interested in this on a correctional facility um, property for extended period of time. So Representative Mahali, let me, let me maybe try this on for size. All right, so we've got the BAA, but just so you know, you don't wanna, doesn't have to stay in BAA. Let's just say in March that, you know, there's, there's wonderful things that happen between now and then, and that there's some sort of new thing. We could literally lift it up and put it in the big bill. Right, because the BAA if it comes back from the Senate, we'll have right. time. Right. We'll come back, they'll have made changes. It's gonna, everything's gonna be percolating. Everything's alive all the time. Right. So Nothing's ever done until, until the governor <coughs> signs it. Right. And conversely, if they don't comply, the money just might disappear from the final bill. It, it, yes. Right, got it. <clears throat> Thank you. And just to be clear, it's not an additional appropriation, unlike no. our housing, no. it's a transfer from one of their right. unspent lines. So we don't have to break this money in as new money. It's right. there, we're just saying, your idea is we're just gonna hold it. Yeah, I, I really, um, you know, to be fair, I, I, uh, I really do see them working with us on this, okay? Yeah. Uh, they know that, you know, we're concerned about uh, the status of, the current status. Um, I, you know, I'm, it's no news to anybody, but acting Commissioner Chen will be gone before this report is due. Uh, and so, you know, I'm hopeful that we can work even sooner. Well, we will continue to be working with the department, you know, even as this BAA is moving through the process. So it's not like we're going to wait for some final language and say, oh, you know, now, <laughs> now we'll get to work. You know, we will be continuing to work on that representative. Model. Thank you. So, You're welcome. <clears throat> so, Madam Chair, I wonder if you know, have they looked at any other sites? State uh, property? Yes, the Department of Buildings and General Services said they had looked at three or four sites. I did, they did not elaborate on which ones they were, but uh, it's a fairly short list. You know, I mean, we own property in Middlesex, we own property in Virgins, we own property in Windsor, um, we own property in St. Albans. <laughs> um, you know, so uh, I suspect but they rule those out for some reason, which we don't know. Uh, I, those would be questions that we would ask. Well, like In more of the wise. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. We're going to move on now um, to the foster care system. Oh, no, nope, Lund. Lund. Sorry, I don't want to skip over Lund. Uh, okay. So. Um, oh, good. Because we were talked about this earlier today. Oh, okay. Okay. All gonna, right. You're going to. Clear us up on this. I have no idea if I'm going to clear you up, but we, we so. had some confusion in our committee yesterday about 1.1 and 1.2. Oh, did you have that same discussion? Oh, okay. Well, good. Well, they are two different amounts. Okay, so 1.1 is in the governor's recommended BAA. Okay, that is for the increased caseload, as we understand it, increased uh, um, caseload related to reach up reach up eligible families. This one point, that was 1.1. This 1.2 million is essentially, uh, and again, it's one-time funds um, to get them through the end of this fiscal year. And before we, I wanna back up just for a second. I know that people are familiar with the Lund Center, but I just want to, I guess, place an asterisk of importance next to the services that they provide for, um, for, moms mostly, um, who have substance use issues and are also trying to learn how to parent their children. Um, and, uh, you know, when, when you're dealing with substance use, um, that's, you know, a major, major thing in and of itself and trying to, to do that um, in a process or in a place where, you know, there are challenges all around you. And so then add to that being a new parent um, and or being an expected parent. And um, so I just I just want to sort of put a human face on the types of services that they provide and to also note for you that three to four years ago, um, DCF eliminated one portion of the program that used to be funded um, for the Lund Center. So if you think about um, if you think about recovery in, in sort of a step process, um, our committee took a, uh, 
a site visit to the Jenna's Promise up in Johnson um, mm -hmm. recently, and uh, they have essentially a three-step process where they move people through from, you know, where they first come in directly from, from um, you know, a short-term <laughs> detox kind of situation into there, and they move them through stages to ultimately um, independent living with supports. And um, the department eliminated step two, um, it, you know, uh, and so the, the sort of more transitional and supports for independent living um, are, are not provided anymore through the Lund Center. And so we need this asset. Um, this is part of our battle against <laughs> substance use and it's part of our battle to um, try to have these children have a different kind of life than, um, you know, maybe that they are born into. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, all right, that was just my, that was just my commercial about the, <laughs> so, important, right. the importance of the yeah. Lund Center. Yeah. So the uh, Lund Center is not just one place. It is, no, no, it is not. Um, so they, there, you will, you saw, I think, in the governor's language about PNMI, private non-medical institutions, rate increases going into effect for PNMI. So the Lund Center is impacted by that in a positive way. So they, they will receive increases, um, you know, when the PNMI if increases, happens. if that goes through. Okay, this is the hold them <laughs> until that happens. This is the close the gap until PNMI happens. And, um, that's um, well. That's it. <laughs> I don't need to say anymore. That's that's. Uh, I don't need to talk anymore. And when you say close the gap until the one point one, uh, well, that's totally no. The one the one point the next year. The one point two that we're recommending here is, is the close is, the gap. That's that's the close the gap, and this is uh, this is not in the governor's recommended okay. budget. Okay. And the one point one is which is. is what's thrown us from right. Yeah, we we're, got confused by that too, but we got it cleared up. Do we get it? Do we don't have it? Yeah, that's where we were. They're two at. separate Thank things. You. Thank you. We got Representative Harry. Uh, so, if I'm reading the notes here, this is to serve an additional eight to twelve individuals. They will be able to increase their capacity with um, staffing it up for the rest of this fiscal year. And then with the PNMI Same. increase going into effect, yes, right. they would be okay. able to have a, a higher level of occupancy. Can they even hire the staff to take care of those eight to 12, or do they need to hire staff to take care of them? Yes, this, this will be part of the plan to increase occupancy. They need to hire in additional staff, yes. Okay, so then it begs my question, especially in anything related to healthcare and mental health, can they, can they hire the staff? I'm not talking about the money. I understand. Um, um, they believe that they can. Okay. They, it's a very, I mean, you know, a mission-driven organization, and there are people passionate about trying to help, you know, young moms with uh, substance use. So they, they believe that that will be possible with this additional funds. And that that will be supported ongoing with the piano. I'm just you know raising the question yeah. because it's it's challenging. Yeah, I, uh, I agree. I understand. Uh, and, uh, okay. Okay. Now moving on to foster care. Um, foster care is you know we hear all about all the other residential programs. Okay, we hear a lot about justice involved youth and okay those are really small portion <laughs> of. The kids that we support in this state who are not either temporarily or sometimes permanently with their families. Um, the foster care system is really the foundation upon which all of that other stuff exists. And um, foster parents uh, have not received sufficient support, in our opinion, um, during the pandemic. They, they were given a one-time um, payment as part of, I don't remember if it was, you know, which version of the COVID money it was. I don't remember if it was ARPA or, or whatever the previous versions were. Now I can't even remember Sierra. their names. Yeah. Um, so they were given a, a one-time payment and there is a calculation that is involved um, with giving them um, sometimes um, a small increase and they have received a 5% increase um, in the rates paid 
Um, and I know you're going to ask me how much is that, and I don't have that off the top of my head. Um, but I will get that. I should have had that. So we are recommending um, to support this uh, group of individuals, and this is something in the way that it is worded is important. Um, uh, uh, One-time payment uh, to foster care providers who have active, uh, who are active as of January one. I mean, we picked January one just because it was the beginning of the year. Um, uh, it wasn't any. There's nothing special about it other than it's New Year's Day. Um, and right now, there are currently 886 children currently in foster care. You'd be surprised how difficult it was for us to get a number of children in foster care. I have heard about that. Yeah. So, so looking for not the reason there's no number there is because it's not in the budget. This there, is a, there is a number. We're recommending approximately four hundred thirty-three thousand no, dollars in the governor's recommendation. There's yeah, it is not, not. This is an addition. There's this no, is not. You won't see a B number. Next to there is not a B number, right? When there's no B number, that means that this is an addition by the Human Services Committee in terms of our recommendation. So four hundred thirty-three thousand. Yeah, that's our best estimate. Representative Shaw. So I appreciate that this system has been highly stressed. What do you expect to be the result of a five hundred dollar payment to the families? What we expect to be the result of that is an acknowledgement by the state and by the system that we value what you have been doing, that we understand the stress that you've been under, and we appreciate you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Not to mention all the increased costs because of inflation, and they, you know, they house and feed and clothe the, the uh, foster children. And their payments haven't been going up, I assume. Not commensurate with the level of inflation yeah. that we've had, no, for sure. Did, did we do other? Sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, having worked on the other side, the state owes a huge debt of gratitude to those foster parents. So just want to say did we? Um, Thank you. What have we done the last couple of years uh, to help foster parents over and above the regular rate? Did we do? We did. Have, that's what I was mentioning yeah, earlier. We yeah. made we made one payment uh, in a previous COVID relief money. Okay. And uh, I'd have to go back and double check the amount. I want to say it was three or four hundred dollars. Um, it was a one-time payment, like we're suggesting here. I'm pretty sure it wasn't five hundred dollars. It was something less than that. I think we started at five hundred, and the department said, "Oh, well, that should be yeah." Anyway, it, 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 that, that sounded like you, Madam Chair. It, <laughs> it, it, did the request come from your committee, or did it come from uh, families that were in the program now? This, this request is from our committee. Um, this is based upon our knowledge of the stress uh, that is being yeah, I, I, I handled by that. Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm just telling you where it yeah. came from. It came from, uh, we, we did not have, you know, hordes of families coming forward and saying, right. you know, this, but they don't okay. have, a, they don't really have a, a, a large voice, okay. to be honest. Are you done? Yeah. <clears throat> thank you guys for wearing your masks so I can stay. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, no, I just, you know, whatever. I'm, thank you. I'm good. This will become <clears throat> law, so to speak, sometime mid-year. Is there any value in recognizing the service of people who come on as foster care between January 1 and, say, June 30th, both because they will be there and also it sort of helps the department with a kind of it's all it's not just a retroactive recognition it's also a sort of a signing bonus would it help if it was june 30th instead of july january 1. um this was based upon uh us being able to put together an estimate based upon the number of um mm -hmm. children in custody so that number is going to fluctuate so, you know, I'm certain their committee would be certainly amenable to, you know, flexible language, but you know, that we wouldn't know the number then. That's correct. So we have the fiscal note yeah. based on. We try to provide as many specifics as we can when we're trying to make a recommendation. We appreciate that. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm going to move on to Dale now, the Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living. So, um, there's a number of things here. Uh, it looks 
like less than it is, um, to be honest. Um, so in B329, um, the department is requesting almost $1.1 million uh, for one time. Um, and this is really for fit up and changes that need to be made uh, to help a long-term care skilled nursing facility or facilities. I, we, we were taking testimony on this um, prior to the governor's budget being released, so uh, they were not at liberty to say how many, how many this was gonna be covering, but uh, this essentially is going to start to address the backlog of people who are held up in hospitals because there's not the next level of care for them to be discharged to. So um, this, this is uh, a one-time expenditure, and I think it's, uh, our committee thinks that it is really necessary, and um, so we support the governor's um, proposal here. Um, supports and services at home, SASH. Again, um, there, like I said, we didn't, we didn't like just write down everything that we agreed with with all the governor's stuff, but some of these things we did. Again, this is um, something that was in the governor's BAA, and we concur with that. Um, in developmental disability services, B333, um, there are a couple of areas here that warrant further explanation just so the committee understands what they're for. Um, it calls out a specific uh, organization, Upper Valley Services. Upper Valley Services is the designated agency for people with developmental disabilities. They cover Orange County, but they also have they have offices in Randolph, Bradford, and they have an office in Moortown, which, as you know, is in Washington County. Um, so um, they also run uh, statewide crisis beds. Uh, the developmental disability system does its best to not utilize the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital uh, to uh, essentially provide the supports and services for people who are in crisis um, within its own system. Are they 100% successful? No, but they are generally very, very successful in doing that. Um, what they are finding, given the acuity level of the people uh, increasing, they really need access to additional crisis beds. And so this is providing uh, some support to Upper Valley Services um, to uh, access on a statewide level uh, additional crisis beds for the system. So uh, part of that is one time, the 400,000 is one time, and the 716 is ongoing, which you will see incorporated into the base budget as you look forward in 24. And that's in the governor's recommend. These are, these are governor's recommend, yes. So both that. Okay, um, in the same area, um, $1.4 million uh, for public safety. These are individuals who have public safety concerns who either age out of uh, DCF custody or who are adjudicated by the courts to be incompetent to stand trial under Act 248. And um, these folks require uh, intensive level of supports for uh, both their own safety but the community safety as well. And this uh, will serve an additional five people. Um, the department has not come forward actually in, in quite a number of years and asked for any additional caseload for this group or, or their general caseload. So, uh, I mean, in budget adjustment. Every year we see it in the regular budget, but not in budget adjustment. So there has been an uptick in, uh, in this area, um, notably this year. Thanks. Um, so are the five people already identified? Yes, these are people who are likely they already, already receiving services. Okay. Yes. And then, um, do we have a sense of how many individuals are in the custody of the commission? I can find that number out for I'd you. I'm just curious to know. What, I, yeah, what I don't know off the top about. of my head. I mean, I can tell you what it might have been 20 years ago, but oh, <laughs> that was long ago. Probably changed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank uh, you. Number, do, number of people who are officially in the custody under Act 248? Yes. Okay, so public safety, just to be clear, is a broader category. It includes people who have gone through the court process, and it also includes people who have aged out of the DCF system, and we're essentially preventing them from going through a court <laughs> process. Um, okay. 
but I'll get the number back to 48 people. Great. Those of you who remember Sandy Haas, this one, Representative Haas, this is something that was near and dear to her. <clears throat> Um, okay, uh, again, an unusual request for the BAA is uh, for people who have experienced a brain injury. Uh, we have uh, home and community-based services under global com commitment for people who have experienced a brain injury. And uh, again, they are experiencing an uptick in both the acuity level and the number of people who are, are needing services, and this would serve seven people. Any questions on that? Okay. Cho choices for care. Um, lots of discussion about choices for care. Lots of discussion about choices for care. So the department is required on an annual basis to submit a report to the legislature on the, um, especially, uh, I guess what I would cost the, you know, sort of truing up the end of year and what, are there any funds remaining? Uh, how would they be invested? Uh, where should they be invested? And there is specific language um, in the green books that is uh, highlighted here at section uh, 33 BSA section 7602. Um, uh, this language, language similar to this uh, was in session law uh, a couple of years back. We were successful in getting this in, in the green books. Yeah. And um, we, while we are, uh, we have ongoing questions. I'm, yes, I'm struggling to find the right words on this. We have ongoing um, questions in this area. Uh, the, as you know, there have been uh, extraordinary stresses placed on long-term care facilities um, throughout the state. Um, we, uh, Representative Page knows about the nursing home in his area that is closing shortly. We've had 10 other long-term care facilities close. Uh, and so the <coughs> Medicaid rates that are paid um, are insufficient to sustain these businesses, frankly. I mean, that's the long and the short of it. Um, however, um, the language around savings specifically targets savings to home and community-based services. Nursing facilities are not considered home and community-based services. They are institutional services. And um, so we have differences of opinion with the department about how that's interpreted. Um, however, so there were ex some what they call uh, extraordinary payments made to um, several nursing facilities, uh, as well as some money invested in rate increases, additional rate increases, for instance, in the home and community-based side from, on, I think it was personal care and homemaker services. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so there, there were investments made. It's all hinging on the determination of how you calculate savings. Um, and when that is done. And um, Representative Lamfer has been around long enough to know about this language, and uh, I'm we not sure. To get it into green I books. know, and I'm not <laughs> sure we. I'm not sure we quite have it right based uh, upon this year's okay. actions. So, um, however, the money has gone out the door. It was, you know, there isn't, and we were not disputing the fact that we needed to make payments as necessary. Um, and so we are concurring with further work to be done with the department on that language. That's why I said. Oh, so maybe in the big bill. Or I, 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 there, there may be um, some, there may be some work on that. That's a, a future story to be told. Yeah. That would be Representative Dolan. Yes. Um, and that just remind me to um, say how much we appreciated um, all of the collaboration between our committee members and your committee members. And uh, it really um, helped, I think, for everybody to sort of be hearing the same things at the same time. And um, just wanted to extend my appreciation. It was, I almost couldn't have a forum because everybody was interested in what we were doing. <laughs> well, we'd like to keep you busy. And we're Oh, yeah. All right, adult day providers. Um, again, you see, no, you see no B number next to this because this is a committee recommendation. Um, uh, this is an ongoing. Yeah. I'm just gonna say you're okay with 
the choices for care piece. Yes. Right now. Yeah. Well, well we, we said do. acceptable. Acceptable. <laughs> Okay. Uh, it's, All right. I just want I just want to make sure I mark it off. Well. Yes, we'll have further discussions okay. with the department about that language, and you may see us returning for okay for now. Yeah, okay for now. Um, adult day providers. Again, this is a uh, recommendation from uh, our committee. Um, there's a you know the ongoing saga of adult day services providing they provide a valuable resources uh, to families who are supporting a, an older Vermonter at home and trying to keep them at home. Um, they have struggled significantly during the pandemic, and this fiscal year is really no exception to that. And there is a report coming out February 15th that uh, we hope will help address some recommendations about uh, how, how to pretend, well, it's not exactly a rate study. We're really talking about the structure of payments, uh, things like paying based upon attendance versus enrollment uh, and, and the like. You know, this is a, a population that uh, has lots of medical appointments. They may not feel well during the day. They, so they might not be there, but um, you know, you're still providing a support to them. You still have to have the staff in order, you know, for when they do come back and they're feeling well to be there. And yet, if you're not there, you don't get paid. So, um, just so imagine our education system if we we only day to day. Exactly. How many were there. Right. <laughs> That's a very good analogy, Madam Chair. Okay, okay. I'm going to have to use that one. Um, so uh, that's what the February 15th report is supposed to do. So this is additional, uh, again, it's one-time appropriation uh, of $2.1 million to sustain the organizations uh, through the end of the fiscal year. Um, I do want to make a point that we have had uh, three facilities <laughs> close, um, two of the, of the three facilities, uh, in an and an additional two of three facilities that UVMMC ran that did not reopen. So, you know, a total of five, uh, we, uh, really reduced access to this service in the state and it's a problem. It's a How big many problem. Other total? Five. five total. That closed. Yes. What is left now? Uh, 10. ten. Yeah, 10. So our committee supports this, and we we do recognize that you know the one-time dollars are going to be drying up, um, and we need to find a way to sustain these services. And you're going to be hearing that throughout any feedback from our committee about Medicaid services. It's um, we are on a house of cards, and the bottom layer has already crumbled, and the other layers are crumbling. Uh, it's it's. Um, it's a crisis state. Um, and speaking of crisis, nursings, uh, home-based nursing. The low utilization payment adjustment, LUPA, this is uh, really also, I think you'll see if you haven't seen already in the healthcare committee, they are also supporting uh, the home health. Again, this is not in the governor's budget recommendation. Um, I believe, um, trying to remember, not mix it up, but I believe that they had been told previously that there would be an increase to get them closer to the Medicare looper rate, but it did not come through. Um, and so they requested our assistance in this. Um, we can provide, they provided information at various different percentages. Um, and at $2 million, that increases up to 100% of uh, Medicare LUPA. Um, and uh, we have information that we can provide if you were interested in something mm. down. But we is thought that general fund or is that rolled out? Uh, Med Mr. Medicaid. This is GC. Okay. Um, and then uh, one of our smallest recommendations uh, has one of the longest, um, <laughs> one of the longest paragraphs. But um, moving on to the Department of Health. We have, um, there is, we didn't really have any uh, major changes in the Department of Health uh, it, to the governors. We didn't have any, actually. <laughs> um, this, this is a relatively minor one, but SAMHSA uh, provided grants under their emer emergency grants to address mental health and substance use disorders during COVID-19. That was the sort of title of this grant um, uh, project. And those funds end on May 31st. And the Department of Health has put funds out to local partners 
Uh, and you can see in the first paragraph the kind of work that they have been doing. Um, what we are requesting, and this would be probably general fund, um, we're requesting approximately $13,000 to fund the final month um, in fiscal year 23. 13000 uh, Yeah, $12,810 um, to fund the final month of FY23. We want the opportunity to really consider whether or not we should be recommending this program continue on an ongoing basis, but we can't do that until the 24 budget process, and this would leave a, a 30 day period, or 30 days, a 31 day period, without, without well, without, um, it would cause an interruption in services if we decide to continue it. So if we decide not to continue it, there's nothing lost other than $12,810. Um, but those services would have continued. So we, it gives us an opportunity to make a decision at a state level whether we want to continue, continue those services or whether there would be any other federal grant monies to continue those services. So that in 24, we don't have this month. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. And um, Got it. Uh, you know, I don't need to tell this committee that you know, our arsenal for uh, substance use services um, is needs as many tools in the toolbox as we can afford. And then our final was sort of a last minute addition. And again, this is something that uh, might ordinarily be in the capital budget. Um, however, due to timing related to a real estate transaction, they Howard Center came forward um, to ask for assistance in securing funds so that they may be able to purchase three buildings located in Rutland. Um, I, I found that interesting that Howard Center runs a program in Rutland, but it's been a program for 20 years. Um, this, this is a program that serves youth who um, have um, inappropriate sexual behaviors and uh, has been very successful in serving those youth. Um, the owner of the building has the buildings up for sale. They would require the program to move. They are not really interested in moving. It would disrupt everything. Um, and uh, the fund balance is at the designate. I asked about, you know, well, ordinarily, this is unusual to see this. Yeah. Ordinarily, you'd be taking out a loan. You'd be going through it. And they said, you know, our, our financial picture right now, we can't do that. We can't take on additional debt in order to continue a program that we've been running. Um, and so, uh, this would actually end up resulting in $150,000 in lease savings. Um, they would then have to be paying taxes and stuff. But um, uh, So this is for the purchase of those three buildings um, uh, in Rutland. And you can see the, the purchase of the buildings, uh, $584,000, and then $368,000 for the capital needs in order to uh, rehabilitate those buildings for uh, you know, use into the future. The program serves, um, has a capacity to serve 20 uh, youth at any given time. And uh, these, I, I wanna point out, these are the type of youth that unfortunately we are sending out of state. Um, you know, so we can't afford to lose this program. You know, we've sent kids as far away as Florida who have some of these same kinds of behaviors. And so, in fact, we don't have sufficient resources in state. So we do not want to risk losing this program, and while this is a, a bit unusual, um, we we are supportive. If you are able to find some one-time dollars to support the purchase of this uh, property to sustain this program, and again, um, Rep. Emmons and her committee yeah. is aware of this. <laughs> Great, we did hear about it. We heard about it in our public hearing. But Representative Shine and Representative Harrison. So um, thanks for mentioning that we all we already are sending people out of state. Do you have a sense of what the cost is when we send people out of state versus in state? It just seems to me intuitively it would be a lot more expensive <clears throat> to send somebody to Florida than to take care of them here in Vermont. Um, I can tell you that light on is pretty high in the <laughs> Department for Children and Families. I can't tell you what the exact you know cost mm -hmm. per. Uh, per participant is, you know, it, it varies from program to program yeah. that they send them out of state, but uh, we certainly uh, can seek to provide additional information about that. Okay, thank you. Representative Harrison. So uh, the notes here say they would save 150000 annually in rent payments. If you took a portion of that, <clears throat> would they just mortgage it? 
to us. I, I, right. Whoever, I mean, but I mean, it just seems to me intuitive. I, I, it's been a little while since I figured out the cost of a mortgage, but if you borrowed a million dollars over 20 years, it would not cost you 150000 a year, it would maybe cost you half of that or something. We're bringing, we're bringing forth the request, um, and I, like I said, I did ask the question uh, about the boring. They indicated that, um, that they uh, don't have the ability to take on additional debt at this time. That was, that was the response that we got back, Representative Harrison. So we had a brief conversation about it, too. We were thinking people did some uh, investigating, you know, kind of off the, off the cuff to find out, like, this is paid through um, child family services. So we have, a, we have a dog in this race, so to speak. But um, I, I, I've I, got that wrong. I, I know. <laughs> I think it's a pony or something. Oh, no. yeah. um, okay. in the race. Right, dog, wrong dog It's okay. The I, I, do, I do that all the time. And um, I, I honestly, I just wanted yeah. to get it yeah. on the record because yeah. they, have, yeah. they have approached many different committees mm -hmm. <laughs> on this. Yeah. Um, they kind of pointed them. So, uh, uh, yeah, they, they've been sent all around the building. And uh, I said, you know, uh, I'll... Make sure that it lands, um, and then you know, be up to you folks to decide whether right. it's funded. But it's we'll, like it has landed. We will continue to have the conversation with the <clears throat> institutions and corrections to see how that will work, right? Yep. Go ahead, sir. Can I ask a general question? Oh, but um, can I just oh. pre the reason that it's here as opposed to in the capital budget is because there is a April 23rd right. deadline. Right. Yeah. Is that in here? Okay. No, well, we, yeah, we're, we we're aware of that. Oh, okay. Yeah. April. That's, yeah. That's April the, um, yeah. Yeah. So, capital and an budget offer deadline. So, Madam Chair, if I may, um, you have a variety of uh, requests over and above what was in the BAA proposed by the administration. My back of the envelope calculation is something like $22, 23000000 million. If we didn't have an extra $23 million, is there any kind of priority on the request that you've made? Um, well, having anticipated that question, <laughs> she is so oh, does she know you. <laughs> uh, well, I didn't know if it would be Representative Harrison's per se, but I anticipated that someone on the committee might ask that question. Um, we really feel in our committee that it's our job to bring the needs of Vermonters forward that we feel meet the priorities. And um, that's what we've done. So, um, and whether or not we can fund all of those will be you know, up to this committee to decide. So these needs that we have outlined here meet the priority list of things that we think that Vermonters need right now in this moment in time. And as you can see, most of them are around the homeless population. That was the no, big No, no, and I'm not big. suggesting any of them aren't. Important. Oh, I know, I understand, yeah. um, I understand. I'm just, you can help us by saying, you know, this is a five-star need right now. This one may be a four-star need or some portion of, it's just, it's helpful because you work, live and breathe this stuff every day. We just look at numbers. Uh, yeah, which is which is why I said it's our job to present the needs of Vermonters, um, and that's what I feel like we have done. Um, you know, if, if I, I'm not going to like throw any of these requests under the bus, um, it's our it's our committee's it's our committee's yeah. work. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think everybody would consider them a five star request. You know, whether the Park Street program should be funded in, you know, should be our recommendation or somebody else's recommendation. I just wanted to get that one on the book so that you're sort right. of officially considering it. So she's not going to answer. No. <laughs> <laughs> They're all crazy. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I'm sure they might, you know, as you indicated, there are, you, you set some limits to um, Representative Dolan and Representative Lonely. Thank you, and thank you for those presentations. I was very much looking forward to hearing from you, so I appreciate that. Uh, a follow-up with um, Representative Harrison's question. There, taking um, some of the sections I'm overseeing, uh, there are some line items in here that you didn't specify or, or identify as, as um, with, with any comments. 
Are you still suggesting that the, the particular line items that you have identified are a higher priority than the ones you did not speak to? Um, no, we just didn't. We followed the instructions mostly <laughs> that said if you agree with something, you don't necessarily need to say it. You don't need to include it in your memo. So um, if there were if there are items that weren't specifically called out, um, that just meant that we uh, agreed with them and you didn't need any further information. We didn't feel like we needed to provide any further information that what the administration had already provided was sufficient. The ones that we agreed with in terms of the governor's BAA and we included in the memo, we felt like you might need additional background material in order to understand that. Thank you. You're welcome. Excellent. Representative Bloomberg. I, I'm just struck by, I, this is a comment. Um, I, I really appreciate the work that your committee did. Um, it's a hard budget to have to react to. Um, and I think, and, and what it reflects to me, um, <clears throat> you know, the fact that $12,810 was identified by a committee member as being critical to then ensuring the continuity of a program like that's that's great that's that's you know I, I really appreciate the thoughtfulness that that um, that went into um, this as far as I can see it but the way that you described it thank you You're welcome I was just going to say the same. I have a really deep appreciation of your committee who met with me repeatedly and <laughs> just the diligence they did in trying to understand the numbers behind some of the requests, particularly with respect to the, the support for families who were at risk of losing housing. Um, I just really appreciate the, the work that was done. Thank, Thank you. you. You know, I, going back to the, your question about priorities, which you didn't answer. Right. I did answer. Right. I said okay. priorities. priorities. Um, <laughs> you know, the hard part is, in some ways, there's a di there really are real differences in these proposals. Some of them are kind of fundamentally humanitarian, like 13 million bucks for people keeping people out of the tent, you know, for two or three months. And others of them are, are we going to cripple our infrastructure if we let something go? And putting a priority on that, it's almost a moral issue, rather than it's hard to find a systemic priority <laughs> basis for that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, I mean, I, my first reaction is all of it, but. Um, yeah, I would say human services is an incredible yeah. To yeah. committee, yeah. emotionally. Mm -hmm. yeah. And thank you. <clears throat> You're welcome. Really. That's okay. You're welcome. Um, and certainly my committee uh, or I are available for any additional questions or clarifications that you might have as you deliberate. Um, we are happy to be of service and um, look forward to our work on the 24th budget. Thank you can thank your whole committee. I know this is so yeah. much work and uh, we really appreciate all the work that you all have done. I will. So. I, uh, you have thank a great you very team. much. Mm -hmm. yeah. our, our goal, Madam Chair, is to um, tie up the BAA by Friday, straw vote. We'll do the final vote on Monday. Um, we will need your wisdom on the floor if we get a lot of digging under the hood. Uh, uh, will will you be I, amicable? I'm happy to be of service in any way I can, <laughs> including, you know, with a shovel to dig you out. You can dig us out or dig us in. No, 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 we were about 15 minutes over, which I thought we were going to be. So thank you. Break, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to have Sarah for a bit. All right.